Hello everyone, welcome to another series in the Academy of Online Radiology Education. My name is Ricky Olmsted. I'm a radiology resident at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. This month we've curated some interesting literature in abdominal radiology. This first article discusses predictive factors for open conversion of laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which is currently the standard of care in treating acute cholecystitis. Of the 581 patients included in this case series who underwent laparoscopic cholecystectomy, 113 required conversion, about 20%. Some of the more common indications for open conversion were difficulty properly visualizing Colo's triangle and dense adhesions. The authors looked at preoperative imaging features that correlated with the need for open conversion and found that lack of gallbladder enhancement on CT, gallstones in the infundibulum, and periapatic inflammation to have a significant association with open conversion. The authors also assigned different values to the different variables and created an equation to predict the probability of open conversion. This article from AJR gives an overview of dual energy CT and how it can be used to evaluate the abdomen. It begins with the discussion of the physics and technical aspects of dual energy CT, followed by current advantages and applications. For example, the article discusses the ability to create virtually unenhanced images from contrast enhanced sequences. This helps to provide additional information when a non-contrast phase is needed to establish a diagnosis. For example, to identify if hyperdense material in the stomach is bleeding or just ingested material. In the liver, dual energy CT allows for fat fraction quantification, which correlates to the degree of steatosis. The article also discusses applications in the gallbladder, pancreas, and bowel. This next article comes from a group at a level one trauma center in Norway and looks at the use of enteric contrast to diagnose hollow viscous injury after penetrating trauma. They looked at 177 cases of penetrating trauma that presented to their center over a four year period. I thought this number was extremely low compared to most of the major trauma centers in the United States. In these cases, CT found 26 hollow viscous injuries with a sensitivity of 69% and specificity of 90%. Patient stability can influence the use of enteric contrast, and sometimes the patient is too unstable to wait for enteric contrast to be administered. The contrast protocols were not standardized in this study, and I think more work needs to be done. This next article discusses the implications of missing or misinterpreting pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Pancreatic cancer has a very poor prognosis, and complete resection is the only chance at a cure. Criteria exist to determine which patients are operative candidates. Early diagnosis is needed to meet the surgical window, but imaging findings may be subtle. This study looked retrospectively at 257 cases of pancreatic, pancreatic adenocarcinoma and reviewed prior imaging for the patients. They used the RADPEER system to evaluate prior reports. Statistically, while missed reads led to, diagno to, while missed reads led to diagnostic delays, these delays did not correlate with worse survival times. More pancreas, this next retrospective study looked at intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms, or IPMNs. These are typically benign but do have malignant potential. In this analysis of 167 surgically resected IPMNs, about half were benign and half were malignant. The authors looked at imaging features and found those associated with malignancy include increased main pancreatic duct size, enhancing neuronodules greater than five millimeters, cyst size greater than three centimeters, and thicker enhancing walls. Clinical features found to be associated with malignancy included obstructive jaundice and an elevated CEA-19-9 level. Patients with neural nodules and obstructive jaundice had a significantly lower survival rate. This next article looks at peristomal hernias after end colostomy. So peristomal hernias are a known complication after in colostomy, maybe symptomatic or maybe asymptomatic. Strangulation, perforation, and obstruction are possible serious complications of peristomal hernias. This study looked at 65 patients with end colostomies for various reasons. 30 of them developed a peristomal hernia. Retrospective analysis looked at imaging and clinical features associated with development of a peristomal hernia. The presence of a pre-existing inguinal or abdominal hernia Large waist circumference and large surgical defects were associated imaging findings, while BMI, COPD, and long operation times were also associated. I thought COPD was an interesting association. This is thought to be due to increased coughing, which results in increased abdominal pressure. Next, an interesting discussion in AJR from both sides of the question, is MRI a good study for evaluating pediatric abdominal pain? Abdominal pain, abdominal pain is one of the most common causes children present to the emergency room. 
the evaluating team has to make a decision of the best imaging study to work up abdominal pain. This article mainly deals with concern for appendicitis. Some of the arguments in favor of MRI are that it does not require radiation, allows evaluation of the entire abdomen, and that ultrasound is operator dependent and can be technically difficult. The authors against MRI as a first-line exam argue that children will not be able to lay still in an MRI without sedation, not all hospitals have access to an emergent MRI, and the cost of MRI compared to ultrasound. This next article proposes standardized reporting systems for both contrast enemas and MRI in the postoperative setting of ileal pouch anal anastomosis, which is a procedure commonly performed in ulcerative colitis. This multidisciplinary article included input from colorectal surgeons and radiologists to come up with a standard reporting system which includes all the information the surgeons like to know. I recommend reading the article to see the whole report, but some of the information that should be included on the MRI on the MRI report includes mentioning the presence of a leak or fistula, evaluation of the transition zone, pouch, and adjacent mesentery. For enemas, the authors describe techniques, indications, and complications that can be evaluated. Some of the pertinent information includes leaks, pouch filling, fistulas, and adequacy of contrast evacuation. This next article from AJR introduces secretin enhanced MRI. One of the main advantages of secretin enhanced MRCP is that it gives a dynamic evaluation of the pancreatic duct. And you can see how the duct changes before and after the administration of secretin. This article gives an introduction into the protocols of secretin MRCP, which also includes the standard MRCP sequences before the administration of secretin. Radiology reports should mention change in the main pancreatic duct over time, as well as changes in duodenal fluid volume after secretin administration. Secretin MRCPs allow for better evaluation of the pancreatic ductal system, which can be affected by a wide range of pathology. Lastly, another article on the pancreas, this time on pancreatic trauma, which is relatively rare. It occurs in only about 2% of all trauma patients and is usually associated with other trauma. This article states that the most important factor in evaluating the pancreas in the setting of trauma is the status of the main pancreatic duct. With ductal injury, Ductal injuries automatically grading at least a 3 on the AAST scale. Common CT manifestations of pancreatic injury are described, and it discusses contusions, lacerations, and traumatic displacement of the pancreatic parenchyma. Additionally, there are secondary signs of pancreatic trauma, such as thickening of the adjacent renal fascia, peripancreatic fat stranding, and fluid in the lesser sac. For more details, you can read our blog where you can find links to the original publications. Please feel free to share your thoughts and questions on our forum, and I will see you next month.